Are there any questions? Oh, for immortality. <laughs> It's still silent, I think. It needs to be repaired. Oh. <laughs> um, are there any questions? Either from a member of the audience or from the rubber ducky. Are there any questions, <laughs> questions about the uh, last lecture? Yes, Kate. Well, but you said that you point out that this is something that is just all the bond diagram that is together. It doesn't necessarily that is three one. But what about um, with, with um, you know the propagator being minus u u u plus k u k u and all that, and, and you said you didn't need the k u k u and um, um, that I just showed. That I just um. That I, I, I just showed in a particular case where there were only where it happened to vanish for individual diagrams. Uh -huh. I'll shortly give a proof which is a proof that shows it uh, vanishes for the sum. And I believe, although here I'm working from memory rather than certain knowledge, uh, that in diagrams with the exchange of uh, let's see, electron scat electron scattering. <coughs> If, if you consider it to a fourth order, I believe that it does not uh, vanish for this diagram, but one must also include this diagram in order to make it vanish. Okay. Order, order. order by order it vanishes. Order to order. I will prove that in the course of this lecture. Uh, yes, sir. Um, yeah. It's dominated by the. What do you get? You get the WKB approximation. Oh, but if you get the classical picture, I mean, if you were talking about quantum mechanics, what would be the object on the left that you call the classical Oh, um. I don't, uh, I don't know. I'm sure that's an answerable question, but I've just never thought about it. In the sense that the WKB wave function tells you quantum mechanics is as much like classical mechanics as it can be, while still not being classical mechanics. You get the corresponding approximation if you in evaluate the functional integral by stationary phase. Now, I asked the question because you get Hamilton's equation that come out of this, but I'm not sure what Hamilton's equation studies if it's like that dominating. The classical mode, that the, uh, that's right. The, the quantum transition matrix is to leading order in h bar, e v i h bar s for the classical motion. What do I write it? Classical for the classical motion. Plus order one plus order h bar, etc. The higher terms in the in the stationary <coughs> phase approximation, and this is according to Feynman q e v minus i h delta t e prime, and. Uh, that's the typical answer you would get if you if you uh, use the WKB approximation and didn't worry about t all the fancy stuff having to do with turning points, which, as you know, are down down in here. Uh, that is, uh, or if you use WKB for unconstrained motion, that's the answer you would get. And. Um, Indeed, even for constrained motions, although it's a terrible mess, the proper way to do the most effective way I know of of generalizing WKB for many dimensional systems is to do the functional integral by stationary phase and say that is the generalization of WKB. That's the method recently developed by Dash and uh, Haslacher and Naveau for handling uh, uh, quite complicated problems with many, many degrees of freedom. But. Um, uh, why this means, why this is the classical limit is because if you start off from this and then study the propagations of wave packets and so on, you find their centers move according to the classical equations of motion and so on, the usual manipulations you get from WKB. Uh, that's uh, not much of an answer, but it's all I... That's all I can give you.
I should uh, continually warn people that, of course, all these things really make in a sense only in Euclidean, after you've done the Euclidean rotation. And you're really not using a stationary phase approximation, <coughs> but dominating a exponential integral by its value at its uh, maximum. That is to say, the minimum of the uh, thing in the exponent, etc. It's really much more like a steepest descent than WKB, but it be becomes easier to think about if we formally play all of our games in, uh, in Minkowski space and resort to Euclidean rotations only when needed to resolve ambiguities. Well, last lecture, I was on the verge of describing to you the bright idea of Fadeyev and Popov. And I will now attempt to describe it. The essential insight of Fadeyev and Popov was that, their guess was that, uh, you, uh, Feynman tells you the sum over histories. However, if you just blindly do the functional integral in a gauge field, you are theory, you are not summing over all histories once and only once, but you're summing over each history many times in all of its various gauge transformed versions. And therefore, you must sum over histories, each history, only once. That was their idea. So this is just the guess. We're going to try and put this, formulate this guess in precise form, then explore its consequences, and then prove it is true by showing that it is equivalent to canonical quantization for the theories we are interested in. <coughs> now, in order to write down the guess of Fadiev and Popov, I will need a finite dimensional, uh, I, it's easier to start with a finite dimensional analog, and um, uh, in which I'm integrating only over a finite dimensional space. And then I will generalize in my usual brutal way by simply changing the, copying down the same equation, but changing some of the symbols to a function space. And then I'll have arrived at their guess. <coughs> the uh, finite dimensional model of what we are doing in a gauge invariant field theory, to imagine we have some function that depends on n plus m variables. That's going to be, in some sense, the analog of the gauge invariant E the I S. I call them z, but they're real variables, not complex variables. z1 to zn, I'll also label as x, xr. r goes from 1 to n. <coughs> zn plus 1 to Zn plus M, I'll label as Y sub S, S equals 1 to M. And the idea is that this function, in fact, depends only on the Xs. The Ys are, so to speak, like the gauge degrees of freedom. You can change the, uh, you can, uh, changing the Ys does not change the value of the function, does not change e to the Is. Perhaps a little picture will be helpful. Of course, I'm restricted to a two-dimensional blackboard, so I have to draw things with one x and one y. And along any of these lines parallel to the y-axis, the function is a constant. They're the finite dimensional analogs in the gauge system of the various motions that are connected together by gauge transformations. Gauge transformations are like translations in the y direction. Now, we want to define an integral. We'll obviously get a divergent integral if we try and integrate this thing over all the z's. So therefore, what we do is very simple. We define an integral where we just integrate over the x's. Well, I was going to use, uh, oh, no, that's just a slovenliness on my part. That I just integrate over all the x's, product on a. That's certainly an integral that uh, cuts each of these equivalent points only once. I'm just integrating along the surface all the y's equal 0. Of course, I don't have to, um, I could write this exactly the same integral as the product on a, integral over all the z's, f 
product on B, delta of YB. That's certainly legitimate. Equivalently, this is this says you integrate over all space, but really restrict yourself to the surface y equals zero. Equivalently, of course, I don't have to uh, restrict myself to the surface y equals zero. I could restrict myself to a surface yb equals fb of the x's. That is to say some curved surface that cuts this thing like this. And then I could write exactly the same integral. I'm just starting out with a very simple expression and continually complicating it. F product on B delta of YB minus FB. Same integral. Integral just is just another way of writing integrated over the X's. Now it may be that the surface, I may be not convenient to parameterize it in terms of yb equals fb of, uh, of, of the x's. It might be better to param it might be given in some form in which the y's are implicitly given as functions of the x's. That is to say, by some equivalent equation, fb of all the z's. Why is it upstairs? because I made a mistake, Zn plus m equals 0. <coughs> that, when you solve for the y's, there are, of course, s of these, b equals 1 to s. Uh, sorry, m. When you solve for the y's, just gives you this again. A completely equivalent way, therefore, of writing the same integral integral product dza f product over the whole space product b equals 1 to m over the superfluous variables oh dear I shouldn't have used f for this thing that's confusing I'll call it g uh, delta of gb a bunch of functions of the z's that sticks you down to the same surface. But then I had uh, better introduce a determinental factor to take account for the fact that I'm integrating with different variables. So I'll multiply by delta, where delta is determinant dGB. Why do I keep sticking these indices upstairs? dGB dyc. That just reproduces exactly the same m-dimensional delta function as before. The Jacobian determinant takes care of what happens when you change variables. And I've got exactly the same situation. I've just rewritten the same integral. This very simple integral, which for which the prescription is just integrate over the x's, I have just rewritten it in an infinitely complicated form. But it is the same integral. Now, armed with this finite dimensional knowledge, I can now describe Fadiev and Popov's prescription for a gauge field theory. In particular, let me describe it for the case of quantum electrodynamics. We have a whole set of fields which transform in various ways under gauge transformations. A mu goes into A mu plus D mu chi. <coughs> chi goes into E to the I, E chi, psi, etc. There may be a billion other charged fields in the theory. These transformations describe physically equivalent situations. Given any history, given any A, psi, etc., as a uh, function of, um, of uh, space and time, I apply a gauge transformation, I get a new set of functions which describe the same history. For notational convenience, I'll assemble a mu 
psi and whatever else is in the theory into a single big field, which I'll call phi, just so I won't have to write product on mu integral dA mu. I'll just write d phi. I have a gauge invariant action, S of phi, that's unchanged by this transformation. It is a functional of phi. Now, the Fadiev Popoff prescription is this. Firstly, one picks a gauge. That is to say, one adopts some condition that out of this infinite family of gauge equivalent motions picks out one and only one. This is equivalent to picking out an integration surface that passes through each of these lines once. For example, typical gauges a gauge is some equation that keep, eliminates your freedom to make gauge transformations. You just adopt such an equation. The, it's the analog of picking the integration surface on the left-hand board. Typical gauges, some gauges, L dot A equals zero. As you all know from your elementary experience with electrodynamics, once you have adopted this equation, you have no further freedom to make gauge transformations, assuming you adopt the usual boundary conditions at infinity, that A falls off at infinity. This is called Coulomb gauge. A gauge that we will find convenient for proving certain theorems, although a terrible gauge in which to work, is the third component of A equals zero. Same story, except instead of the Laplacian, you have D3 squared when you see the effects of the gauge transformation. Awful gauge destroys the manifest rotational invariance of the theory. But it's called axial gauge because it picks out a certain coordinate, i.e. a certain axis. Another possible gauge. called Lorentz gauge. You may be a little bit worried when you say uh, Lorentz gauge, well, there you don't, haven't completely fixed your gauge because you can add a solution of the uh, D'Alembert equation. But you have to remember we're secretly doing all of our functional integrals in Euclidean space, just, uh, just uh, hiding it with our notational perversity. And Euclidean space, the D'Alembert equation is the Laplace equation. And again, if you assume everything goes to zero at infinity, has uh, no non-trivial solutions. Now, so those are possible gauges, and one could obviously write down many more. Some complicated nonlinear function of the A's and size, as long as it fixes your freedom to make no further gauge transformation. I can now state the Fadiev Popoff prescription, or guess, or ansatz. It is the direct generalization of this prescription to, right here, written right up here, to the function space case. There's a normalization factor, as always. There is an integral over all the fields, d phi. There's an e to the i s, just like always. There is a um, delta of g where it gives whatever function you have chosen there, whatever equation you've chosen to fix your gauge, there is a determinant. The determinant is the determinant of delta g d chi. Chi is the analog of the y variables. Chi is the thing which you change when you change, moves you along these lines, turns you from one configuration to a gauge invariant configuration. And delta of g is, of course, an n-dimensional uh, dimensional delta function for n equals infinity. It is a delta function in function space. 
to wit, it is normalized so that integral df delta of g minus f equals 1, the analog of our finite dimensional product of delta functions up here. Now, two remarks actually, three remarks actually, should be made before I ask for questions on this thing. Firstly, this prescription may be right or may be wrong, but one thing it is sure it is gauge invariant. I have directly proved that it doesn't depend on the, in the sense that it does not depend on the choice of g. Whatever your g is, you will certainly get the same value of the integral for any one g or for any other g. So the show it is because of this argument up here. It's the same integral, no matter what the g is. So this integral in Coulomb gauge, actual gauge, or Lorentz gauge will look very different, but it'll have to give me the same answer. Thus, I can, if I can prove it is right, i.e. equivalent to canonical quantization in any one gauge, just one, then it has to be right in all gauges because it's the, say, secretly the same thing, although it looks very different. Second remark, I have assumed in this, I've pulled a little swindle over off on you by assuming S is gauge invariant. Now, typically, the S's we've been talking about before involve source terms like J mu, A mu, and uh, uh, eta psi, et cetera, which, of course, break the gauge invariance. Uh, therefore, in order to make sense out of this thing, I must say that S merely has sources in it coupled to gauge invariant operators, like F mu nu squared, or psi bar psi, or psi bar gamma mu psi. That is to say, it's only those formally gauge invariant combinations, things that would be gauge invariant in the classical theory, that I would expect to be independent of what gauge I choose to do my computations in. Since I also believe firmly, as I have said to you several times, that the only real physical observables are gauge invariant quantities, that should be sufficient to characterize the theory. If I can show that the Fadiev Popov ansatz gives the same results for Green's functions of strings of gauge invariant operators, in any, no matter how I choose the G, then I've shown it defines the same physics in any gauge, no matter how I choose the Gs. Once I've settled down in a particular gauge, of course, to do my computations, then in order to evaluate my functional integral perturbatively, it might be indeed a convenient tr idea to introduce sources coupled to A's and Psi's and things like that as an intermediate stage. But I shouldn't expect A -A Green's, the AA Green's function or the Psi Psi bar Green's function to be independent of my choice of G, just the gauge invariant operators I construct from them. Is this point, these two points clear to everyone? The third point is, as everything, I, this is a point I could have written on a big piece of paper and hung up here during this entire discussion. Everything here must be taken with a grain of salt because this is just formal manipulation of canonical field theory. And as usual, at the very end, we'll have to worry about the ultraviolet divergences and whether they mess up our manipulations. Functional integration is more compact than manipulation of the canonical equations of notion, but it's no more rigorous. When we're done with all this, we'll have to go again and see if we can put in a cutoff that preserves all the formal properties we wanted to preserve. Okay. In particular, we'll have to worry about cutting off this theory in such a way that the gauge invariance is maintained. We can do it, and we will do it. Now, are there any questions about anything I have said or the meaning of this prescription? I'm assuming you've been sat deep in this stuff for two weeks, so you know what an expression like this means, and you know what an expression like this means. But if you don't ask, because if you don't ask, you'll never know. Hmm. Yes? Because we're really working in doing our functional integrals in Euclidean space. Lorentz gauge, what's the argument that the Coulomb gauge picks out a, a unique gauge? <coughs> If I make a gauge transformation starting out from Coulomb gauge, A goes into A plus grad psi. If I'm to stay in Coulomb gauge, this means that del squared chi equals 0. 
If I assume my usual boundary conditions, which I can do with no harm, that A vanishes at infinity, this implies that chi equals zero. Laplacian has a unique inverse with sensible boundary conditions. Now, Lorentz gauge plus d mu chi, and the equation is del squared chi equals zero, and we normally say, even if we impose boundary conditions that things vanish at infinity, this has many solutions, to wit, all the uh, free motions of a massless scalar particle. But really, our integration is being done in Euclidean space, and this is the Euclidean del squared, which has the same properties as the Laplace operator. To wit, it has a unique inverse, and it has if the only solution of, with reasonable boundary conditions of Euclidean del squared chi equals zero is chi equals zero. We're really not doing our functional integrals in Minkowski space. We're doing them in Euclidean space. Yeah, you're losing information. You're losing the plus i epsilon prescription, and that's there in the little note that after you solve things in Euclidean space, you go back and rotate in a certain way to get back into Minkowski space. Okay, the plus i epsilon, you're losing the pole in the propagator when you rotate in Euclidean space. That pole is off in Minkowski space, and that pole is where the free solutions lie. There was another hand raised, but maybe it was the same question. Yes, sir? Um, what you said you were going to do is to show us how we can cut quantization relations. Quantization, yeah. Yes. So it's the expression. No, no, not the different Feynman rule. The same, uh, the same generating functional. For gauge invariant opera. Yeah. Yeah, this also shows that when I said how to do it by canonical quantization, I said there was a part where we had which we had to verify that the final quantum theory doesn't matter what gauge you start at. The Fadiev Popov ansatz will also serve to demonstrate that. I will. I will do. I will do because in any gauge you choose, you can show. I will just do it for one. But if you have some other gauge that you love, <laughs> you can write down the canonical quantized answer in the in the form of a Fadiev show its equivalent to the Fadiev Popov integral. Okay, and therefore. The physical, physically meaningful results, string, vacuum expectation values of time order strings of gauge invariant operators will be the same in this gauge and as the gauge I love. <coughs> this is the power of the functional integral. It enables you to change variables with unparalleled, it doesn't enable you to prove anything. You've always got to come down to canonical quantization at one stage or another. But when you, it enables you to change variables with unparalleled facility and therefore, the more changes of variables you have to worry about, the more useful the functional integral is. And therefore, in gauge theories, where you have this enormous family of changes of variables to worry about, the functional integral is practically an essential way of doing things. OK? You'll see it. OK. Now, in any of the three gauges we have considered, this uh, determined, this operator, DGG chi, is a constant. It does not depend on the phi fields. We could have written down some more perverse gauges in which it did. But in all of these cases, DGG chi is, in this case, the Laplace operator, in this case, the D'Alembert operator, in this case, a uh, delta function, a uh, derivative of a delta function. But in any case, a differential operator, in any case, it is a constant. So for all our gauges, for the three gauges explicitly displayed, not for more perverse gauges. Is independent. 
independent of phi. So we can absorb delta in n. If we were working in a more complicated, more perverse choice of gauge for the abelian case, or if we were doing a theory with a more complicated group of gauge transformations, like a non-abelian gauge field theory, in which you gauge not just electric charge conservation, but say isospin conservation, or some analog thereof, then we would, in general, not be able to get rid of the determinantal factor, and we would have to treat it in the usual way by putting it into the exponential through ghost fields. But I shan't do that here, because I don't need to do it. Now, I will uh, first apply the ansatz, assuming it is true, and then prove it is true. Okay? Just so you get an idea of what we want, why it's a good thing to have. Application. Choose G equals D mu A mu minus F, where F is some fixed function. That's a generalization of Lorentz gauge, but it's still true that the determinant is a constant. F doesn't enter into the computation of the DG D chi, and therefore I can do it. Fadi F. Popov says Z is integral over everything. E to the I S delta normalization factor D mu A mu minus F. Independent of F. It's the same z, no matter what f is. It looks like there's an f there, but that's a lie. Since it doesn't depend on f, I can also write z, the same z, possibly a new normalization function, integral d phi df, some function of f, functional of f, any functional of f, e the i s, delta of d mu a mu minus f. Since if I have a function that is independent of f, I can integrate it over f with any weighting function of f and get the same answer other than the proportionality factor. I will now choose f of f to make life easy. Well, then I can, sorry, I can now do the integral over f, d phi, f of d mu a mu, e to the i s. Yes, sir? Uh, the second step where you define uh, z prime, that is... No z prime, that was a slip of the show. It's uh, the same z. Z, z. n prime, then that assumes that... The reason you can do that is because f does not affect z. That's right. This is an equation. No matter what f is, this is still the same. That just shifts the little integration surface around, but that doesn't affect the integral because s is gauge invariant. Now, I will now, of course, choose f to be an exponential of a quadratic form. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Alpha is a real number, which I will later choose at my convenience. And I will choose that particular form. <clears throat> I then have z equals n prime integral over everything e to the i times an effective action. 
S effective. is integral d4x, an effective Lagrangian, and the, if I, uh, sorry, I, no, no I here, and L effective equals the usual thing, minus one quarter f mu nu, f mu nu, plus all the other terms that are there, as usual, plus one over two alpha, E mu, A mu squared. Please notice, by this device, I have taken care of the problem that bothered us before, that there was no contribution from the four-dimensional longitudinal part of the field to the action. And therefore, when we attempted to find the longitudinal part of the propagator, we got 1 over 0, or infinity. Now we can just read off the propagator. These are the quadratic terms in the thing. A mu propagator is, from this thing, we've already done it. That's minus i, g mu nu. That just involves the transverse part of the field. one over k squared. From this part, again, I just have to invert this. This just involves the longitudinal part of the field and two derivatives. So I get, uh, other than the sign, which I worked out last time, plus alpha, the projection on the longitudinal part divided by k squared, because there are two derivatives there. That's just our rule. Invert the quadratic part of the Lagrangian to get the propagator. That's the universal rule for functional integral. Alpha can be anything. The Fadi of Popov ansatz, I haven't yet shown it's right, but whether that is agrees with canonical quantization. But whether it's right or wrong, any gauge invariant quantity computed using any value of alpha will give the same answer as the same gauge invariant quantity computed using any other value of alpha. It's either all these values of alpha are right together or all these values of alpha are wrong together, but one thing that we have already proved is that they are all equivalent to each other. In a slightly different use of the word gauge in the literature, this family of representations of electrodynamics of the same physical theory are called covariant gauges because there are other, actually in the fadiev popov sense, they all represent different ways of integrating over a different family of gauges, none of which are covariant. That just means the propagator looks nice and covariant. <laughs> if we'd done the same thing with Coulomb gauge, we would have had an extra term just involving the space part of K because we've only got space derivatives and it wouldn't look Variant. The, um, <clears throat> they have various names for some particular choices. The two most popular ones used in the literature are alpha equals 1, where the k mu k nu over k squared term cancels and you obtain for the propagator just minus i g mu nu over k squared. And I see I left out the i epsilon. Oh, I'm in Euclidean space, but just to remind you that back in Minkowski space, there is an i epsilon. I'll put it in. And this is called Feynman gauge. And it's useful for a lot of purposes. In particular, it's useful for evaluating low order Feynman graphs, where you don't want to keep track of all those k's. And it's nice just to have a g mu nu instead. And another choice is alpha goes to 0, which looks like a singular limit here, but is really just restoring the uh, delta function in its original form. Uh, alpha goes to 0, which is um, yields a propagator minus i g mu nu minus k mu k nu over k squared 
over k squared plus i epsilon. And I guess I better put a plus i epsilon here because the rule is always the same. It's got to be analytically continuable to Minkowski space. And this is called Landau gauge because its utility for certain general arguments was pointed out by Lev Landau. Are there any questions about any of this? Okay, it's all extremely straightforward once you're able to organize the computation properly. All of these gauges are going to give you the same answers for any gauge invariant quantity. Of course, non-gauge invariant quantities will look different in different gauges. In particular, the photon propagator, which is non-gauge invariant because amul is not, looks different in different gauges. Now, I've shown that all these gauges are equivalent, or indeed billions of other gauges, which you may amuse yourself, if you wish, writing down and computing what the propagator is in axial gauge, or things generated from axial gauge or Coulomb gauge, are equivalent. Oh, dear. This is the part where I was desperate to look at my notes, and I see when I assemble them. Hmm. Oh, well. Struggle. <laughs> I don't have written down here the proof that uh, if in an appropriately chosen gauge, this is equivalent to canonical quantization. But uh, I'll struggle through it if I can remember how it goes. <laughs> in fact, I never worked it out afresh for here. That's right. What happened was I started writing last night on what I, and I just thought I had that all written out for the previous lecture where I was expecting to cover more material, and I just discovered I didn't. Ha <laughs> ha. Well, it won't be in the notes, but I think I can remember the proof. Hmm? Yeah, we're going to have a lot of sign problems. Okay, what I will do is show Canonical quantization <coughs> in a particular gauge. Because once I show it's true in any one gauge, I've shown it's true in all other gauges in axial gauge. Axial gauge turns out to be super easy to canonically quantize. I remind you, that's the gauge A3 equals 0. So our first step is to canonically quantize the theory in axial gauge, just imposing the condition A3 equals 0 to fix a gauge, finding a set of P's and Q's, and writing things in PQ form, and then show that that's equivalent to canonical quantization. <clears throat> now, as usual, the clue is the first order form of the Hamiltonian for, for the Lagrangian which we, I have written down, uh, but not with me. So if someone will read it out. <laughs> there is some coefficient of f mu nu, f mu nu. And then there is uh, f mu nu plus one quarter. Then this is minus a half. Minus one quarter f mu nu. Yes, that's right. But then when I minimize this, this becomes minus one quarter, minus a half plus. Uh, I remember it better than you characters. Okay. Hmm? No, I mean if I eliminate this is the form I had on the board. If I eliminate f mu nu, I get this divergence. I plug it in, I get minus one half plus plus one quarter is minus one quarter. <laughs> A plus, sign. a plus sign on the first term, yeah. Isn't that... Uh... You can put them another way and get the same answer. Oh, I had a minus and a plus. No, that gives me plus. No, no, it was minus one half and a quarter. Hmm? It was minus one half and plus one quarter. Minus one half and plus one quarter. Was that... 
Someone read me coefficients, please. Any coefficient. Someone who has good notes, just read. Minus one half. No, that's wrong. If I wrote the, if I wrote the, that. Get, I've got to. I've got to have the fact that when I differentiate with respect to f mu nu. Okay, then the this is correct. Plus other terms, which I'll write dot dot dot, because they are not going to play an essential role in the game. Okay. Yes, plus one quarter minus one half. Thank you. Yes. Yes. No. There is some right way of writing it, and it's not going to be particularly relevant. Now, I wish to impose the condition A3 equals um, A3 equals 0. I wish to separate out the space and time, uh, the uh, one and two components, the three components, and the uh, zero component. And therefore, I will use i and j for one and two only and explicitly put out the terms involving zero and three. <coughs> now, therefore, I can have this equal to i and j. I can have uh, one of these equal to i and one of these equal to 3. And then I'd better make that 1 half. One half. Be DJ. DJ, thank you. F i3. But here I only have one term, d3 ai, on account of a3 equals 0 by my gauge condition. I can have i and 0. i0, 1 half fi0. D, uh, D0 AI minus DI A0. And I can have, unfortunately, carrying it on onto the next board, 0 and 3. So I can have 1 half F03, F03. And I now only have uh, D3 A0 uh, minus. Um, I sh sh shouldn't have put a 1 half here. That becomes a minus 1 for the same reason. Minus <coughs> F03 D3 A0. OK, plus dot, dot, dot. Now, this is a hideous mess obtained by a straightforward procedure, though, of just writing down all possibilities. <laughs> and canonically quantizing it is like uh, shooting a fish in the barrel. The, as you see, it comes right off. A, the independent variables are AIs. AI is the independent field. F0I is the canonical momentum. Everything else is constrained. Fij is trivially constrained, just given in terms of the time derivative of the space derivatives of Ai.
A0 is trivially constrained. It obeys a first order differential equation involving, when I differentiate this thing, di fi0, and uh, um, that's all. It's di fi0, I guess. No, it's also up there. There's also d3 f03. Fij, a0, and f03 are constrained variables. If I vary this Lagrangian with respect to them, I give, I give equations, trivial equations, that determine them in terms of ai and f0i at equal times, at, the, at fixed time. Therefore, by our uh, general rule, for the, if I integrate over the f0i's, <clears throat> integral product over all the f mu nu's, normalization factor, product dA1, dA2, dA0. The constrained variables disappear since the coefficients of the things that constrain them are just constants. And I'm left e to the i s, first order. For I no, I is 1 and 2. There is no A3. So, so you, have, you have four independent variables? That's right. Two AIs and their canonical momenta, which are F0I, period, plus whatever is there for the Fermi fields and the other fields. Um, oh, no problem. It'll be there. D psi d psi star, d psi bar, if, there are, if it is the Fermi theory we are looking at, e to the i s, first order, is equal to the Hamiltonian form, and is therefore right, because doing the integrals over, first doing the integrals over these variables just eliminates them, and the rest is p q dot minus h is the action written in terms of ai and f0i. Just the same argument as before. Because it is Hamiltonian form. Okay, I slopped it up because I didn't work it out last night and I thought I had, but anyway. The equations are here, and it should be clear. It's just totally, it's totally straightforward. You have all these variables which have to be eliminated. Fi3, Fi0, oh, sorry, not Fi0, Fi3, F03, and A0, and Fij, and they are just eliminated by doing the integral. That fixes them. They're fixed in the most trivial way. On the other hand, we could do the same thing by first integrating over all the f's. As always, that eliminates the f and brings the Lagrangian back into second order form. Therefore, this is equal to integral d da1, da2, da0, d psi, d psi bar, e the i s in Lagrangian form. That is to say, written in terms of the a's and psi's with second derivatives. Now, but this is equivalent to integral product on all mu, d a mu, d psi d psi bar e to the i s in Lagrangian form times delta of a3. That's trivial. Integral d a3 delta of a3 is something we used to equal to 1. It's easy to multiply it by that. <laughs> but this, the bottom line, which we probably can't see because it's hiding in the chalkboard, is precisely the Fadi of Popov ansatz for axial gauge. 
Therefore, the proof is done. With some confusion, the waste of five minutes, because I hadn't prepared it, and I had to make up my notation as I went along, the proof is done. And axial gauge is absolutely trivial to show that the Fadiev Popov ansatz is equivalent to canonical quantization. Since the Fadiev Popov ansatz is um, independent of uh, what gauge we choose, if it is right in axial gauge, it is right in any other gauge, and the game is done. Okay. As an exercise, I leave for interested people who were confused, who got confusion I radiated in the immediate intermediate stages, I recommend that you do the same thing in Coulomb gauge. Then it's a little harder because you have to split the three part of A into a transverse and longitudinal part and do the integral over the longitudinal over, uh, and uh, do the same games with longitudinal replacing three. But the answer ends up being the same. It is the same thing as doing the thing in, by the Fadiev Popov method. And therefore, the same thing as canonically quantizing it in axial gauge. I remind you that actual, I emphasize that axial gauge is an absolutely terrible gauge for doing any conceivable kind of computation. Okay. To doing any computation, because not only is Lorentz invariance of the theory not manifest, the rotational invariance of the theory isn't manifest. These are the wonderful gauges for doing computations in. But the point is canonical quantization in these, where you get the propagator out like this, is very difficult. It requires a long, long chain of arguments where you introduce subsidiary fields and then show they don't matter and put conditions on the states, and it takes hours. Okay. This gauge is terrible to do for computations, but uh, canonical quantization is trivial. The power of the functional integral method is that enables us to prove that in a given formula is the right formula in a gauge where canonical quantization is trivial, and then with unparalleled facility, instantly transform to a gauge in which the Feynman rules are simple. Are there any questions? Now, before I, I, I can't do a bunch of computations in massless uh, electrodynamics because they're all the computations I've done in massive electrodynamics last lecture. I've just shown that that's right. Not only is the mass zero limit of massless electrodynamics, but right if you do mass of massive electrodynamics, but also right for um, real electrodynamics, massless electrodynamics, if you approach it directly by canonical quantization. However, I do want to say one more thing about massive electrodynamics. I want to show, in general, that in massive electrodynamics, that k mu, k nu over k squared term in the propagator doesn't make any difference over m squared. And this I did last time, so thank God. I will now proceed without confusions, hesitations, false start, and butchered notation to explain the same method. Getting rid of k mu k nu over mu squared in massive vector meson theory. The, um, what I will do is this. I'll write down Lagrangian for the theory. For simplicity, I'll restrict myself. the Fermi case. The Bosch case can be handled by similar methods, identical methods. And now I will do something. This is the whole Lagrangian. That's all there is. I will now add an extra term to it involving a new field that I will call phi. 
where A and B are parameters that I will later adjust cunningly. This, of course, doesn't change the physics in the slightest, because this phi, there is no coupling of the phi field to anything else. It's just a free field that I've added on. Therefore, I, uh, I'm free to choose. Uh, it's something that doesn't affect the physics. If my only sources in my functional integral are coupled to psi and A, then I might as well write as an integral over d phi of this additional thing that just changes the normalization factor. In particular, since phi is totally unphysical, I don't have to apply any particular positivity or negativity constraints on A and B. They can be anything. If they have the wrong signs, phi will be represent a field with negative energy or negative probability because it has the wrong sign in the propagator. But screw that. It doesn't couple to anything, so who cares? <laughs> I will now make a change of variables, which I'm allowed to do. And I will define psi prime by this equation, which may be familiar to those of you who struggled through homework problem number three. <laughs> the d mu psi is, of course, e to the i e phi d mu psi prime plus psi prime i e d mu phi. Such a I will now trade my variable psi prime for the variable psi. Such a change of variables will, of course, affect the psi prime, the Green's function. a mu squared plus psi prime bar i d slash minus e <coughs> a slash minus e d slash phi uh, minus um, m psi prime plus one half a d mu phi squared minus one half b phi squared. Notice we have introduced an illusory coupling between psi prime and phi. Illusory because, in fact, it doesn't affect any S matrix elements. Notice, however, that I have cunningly arranged matters, so the only thing that comes in to a fermion vertex is the combination A slash plus D slash phi. Therefore, I can simplify my Feynman rules by considering not the, separately the propagators for A and phi, but the propagators for the combination. The only thing that enters the interaction, what is the propagator? Plus d mu phi. So that's the only thing that comes in that couples to the Fermi field. Well. We have an I minus d mu nu plus k mu k nu over mu squared, k squared minus mu squared. Out of laziness, I suppress the I epsilons. And for the derivative of phi, we know how to handle derivative couplings. That gives us plus k mu k nu. And we know how to compute the phi propagator. That's a k squared minus b. Any questions about this operation? Any one of these will give me exactly the same. Any choice of A and B, it doesn't matter. They give me different looking Feynman rules, but I will compute exactly the same S matrix. Now, by cunningly choosing A and B in two different ways, I can make this propagator look considerably more simple. A. A equals minus mu squared. B equals minus mu fourth. 
Why do I make that change? Well, I make that change because it makes this term here and the k mu k nu over mu squared term exactly cancel. <laughs> it leads to a propagator minus i g mu nu over k squared minus mu squared. I say the quote, I call this quote Feynman gauge. I put quotes on it because this is massive electrodynamics, electrodynamics with a massive photon. Of course, it has no gauge invariance in any real sense. Nevertheless, it looks like the Feynman gauge propagator in ma genuine gauge invariant electrodynamics with a massless photon, except that I've got a k squared minus mu squared in the denominator instead of a k squared. Second choice that's sometimes useful. <coughs> Uh, let me see. A equals minus mu squared. B equals zero. Uh, <clears throat> this choice, well, it's a little harder to work out the algebra, but let's see what happens. Minus i g mu nu over k squared minus mu squared plus k mu k nu over mu squared k squared plus i k squared minus mu squared k squared k times that's rationalizing all the denominators times k squared uh, <clears throat> No, I guess I'd better make it mu fourth to rationalize all the denominators. K squared mu squared. That's the term that's sitting here. And then A, I have, uh, I already have a, a mu fourth in the denominator, so I don't have to worry about that. I already have a K squared, therefore minus, uh, whoops. What am I saying? Did I say something crazy? That was a bit too rapid. A bit too rapid. Let me not rationalize my denominator. K mu k nu over mu squared. I'm sorry, no mu fourth. What am I saying? Mu squared k squared minus mu squared k squared. The first term is then k squared. The second term is minus k squared minus mu squared. That's right. I now did it right. I correctly did elementary algebra, always a triumph for me. <laughs> and we observe that um, in this case, this combination is, of course, just mu squared, which cancels the mu squared out here. So I obtain minus i g mu nu minus k mu k nu over k squared over k squared minus mu squared. This looks just like Landau gauge. So in the massive theory, I can perform exactly the same transformations I performed in the massless theory. I can make the k mu k nu part of the propagator look like whatever I want by appropriately playing this trick or appropriate generalizations of it. And uh, there again, the situation is as desired. This proves in general that we can get rid of this troublesome k mu k nu over mu squared term in the massive case. I should say that this part of the trick does not generalize to non-abelian theories. If we had a non-abelian gauge group, the massive theory would be uh, not be able to be transformed to look like the massive th massless theory. Those of you who are going to at, uh, Harard at Hof's lectures have probably already discovered that. Massive Yang-Mills theory is not, uh, does not smoothly go into massless Yang-Mills theory as the mass goes to zero. Questions? Yes, sir. Could, could, could we describe this by saying 
That's right. We've introduced a dynamical variable that, well, we've simulated a gauge transformation by introducing an extra dynamical variable, and we haven't changed the physics because the extra dynamical variable is decoupled from everything else. Now, I am sorry that I went through several, some, I probably didn't get enough sleep tonight, last night, and uh, I am, uh, or this morning, or whenever, and I lectured as if I was waiting, to, I was in mud up to my neck, and sometimes above my neck, and for that I apologize, but I hope all of this has been clear. Uh, there are questions. Yes, sir? Uh, what other case? It works also. I mean, obviously, the fact that these are Fermi fields and not uh, and not uh, Bosch fields is irrelevant. But hmm? yeah, the condition is that only the mass term break gauge invariance. Otherwise, I'd get all sorts of extra terms from this transformation. Of, if the interactions of the Fermi fields were such as to break gauge invariance, that is to say, if there were not a conserved current, I couldn't pull this trick. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, uh, in the free field theory, we discussed A would equal to B there. So why can A and B be anything here? Because you can. Um, a has to be A has to be positive to get a physically sensible theory. A and B both have to be positive. Then we absorb A in the normalization of the field, and we're left with B. Uh, if A and B are not positive, you do not get a physically sensible theory. You get a theory with tachyons if, if A and B have opposite signs. And if they have the same sign but both wrong, if they're both negative, you get a theory where the propagator has a minus sign in it and you've destroyed the positivity of the inner product in the Hilbert space. Uh, the, uh, that would be disgusting. No one would want to consider such objects mm -hmm. if they really entered into the dynamics. But since they're independent of the dynamic, they, they, they never affect the dynamics. They're just completely decoupled off in the world by themselves. They can be as pathological as you want. You don't <laughs> care. They're just, you know. I mean, you have to, in, in order to get this in the form where it is Feynman gauge like, it is g mu nu over k squared minus mu squared. You know there has to be some pathological degree of freedom in the theory someplace because the poles of the propagator, three of them have the right signs, but one of them has the wrong sign. I have to retract my question. Okay. To it's too late. It's already been answered. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I've now said uh, practically all that needs to be said about the theory on a formal level and in low orders of perturbation theory. And now it's time to begin tackling the um, question of renormalization. You might think that we had taken care of all the problems associated with renormalization. Let's, for simplicity, restrict ourselves to uh, genuine electrodynamics, the theory without a photon mass term. Because we have now put the propagators of our theory in Landau gauge or Feynman gauge, it doesn't matter, into the same form, as far as their high K behavior goes, as ordinary spinless boson propagators. They go off like 1 over k squared, whether you're in the massless theory or the massive theory. Um, and therefore, we could apply exactly the same rules as far as BPH goes. It doesn't know Lorentz invariance was involved in the statement of the theorem. You could just treat these as four scalar mesons, which have 1 over k squared propagators. And uh, some funny signs, g mu nu over k squared, well, it's four things with 1 over k squared. So they couple the gamma mu's in a non Lorentz invariant way, but who cares about that? So we could just try the straight BPH renormalization procedure, starting out, say, prime squared. The prime now means it's a renormalized field plus the renormalized
<coughs> where this is now the physical charge, however we're going to define it, perhaps L of BPH is zero momentum transfer, and that's the physical mass, that's the mass, perhaps defined L of BPH, and these are the renormalized fields defined the usual way, and we would systematically go through the BPH procedure and generate counter terms. Now the interaction is of renormalizable type. It's of dimension four. It's exactly like a scalar meson Yukawa coupling. And therefore we just can't, the only difference is that because A has an extra index, Lorentz invariance will allow us to write down some more counter, oops, sorry, left something out plus 1 over 2 alpha d mu a mu squared. That tells me what gauge I'm working in. We could just run through the whole thing and generate the counter terms. And we know they must be all terms, all possible Lorentz invariant terms of dimension less than or equal to 4. So we'll just write them down and see what the possible counter terms are given by the BPH procedure. And then we'll discover something disgusting. Dimension 2. Well, as in the scalar theory, we could have a ma scalar mass counter term, and we could have a mass counter term here with some coefficient. I'll call it capital A. Please don't confuse it with the electromagnetic field. A mu, A mu, it's a numerical coefficient. Mm, that doesn't look so good, does it? <laughs> don't want the photon to have a bare mass. <laughs> well, let's keep on going. Dimension 3, we could have a psi bar psi counter term. That's the only possibility of dimension three. Dimension four, we could have a psi bar d slash psi term. That's nice. That's a wave function renormalization of the psi field. I should prime all these. They're renormalized fields. We could have a uh, renormalization of the uh, coupling constant, which I put down here for um, uh, purposes of, with an EX displayed explicitly to make less things simpler later on. We could have a um, that's a wave function renormalization for the photon. And we could have a renormalization of the alpha term. And finally, we could have, just like a phi-fourth, that's the complete counting of possible counter terms by BPH. They're all the terms with dimension less than or equal to 4 that are consistent with the invariances of the theory, Lorentz invariance. And I guess I've implied parity invariance also because I haven't written down psi bar gamma 5 psi or psi bar gamma 5 a slash psi. OK? Just conventional reasoning, exactly as we applied it to meson nucleon theory at the end of last semester. I've applied it to here. I've written down all possible counter terms. Now, you see, some of these are disasters. This is the unfortunate situation. Because if we generate a terms or g terms, We've destroyed the gauge invariance of the theory. But it was only the gauge invariance of the theory that said things were independent of alpha. And the theory was equivalent to canonical quantization and axial gauge. If we didn't have gauge invariance, we don't have alpha independence. We don't have equivalence to canonical quantization. And all hell can break loose. We don't know that this is a physically sensible theory if we have those terms around. It may be some theory with uh, ghosts that are physically observable or lack of conservation of probability or some incredible nonsense might happen. So absolutely essential A equals 
um, g equals 0. Because those terms break gauge invariance. And if those terms are generated, the whole thing goes into the garbage can. We had a nice formal structure, but it's not preserved by renormalization, so forget about it. It would be very nice, although not absolutely essential, <coughs> if C equals minus V. C is the coefficient of D psi bar prime D slash psi, and D is the coefficient of psi bar prime E A slash prime psi. The reason is, I said that if they were different, it didn't really matter. I could interpret that as a renormalization of the electric charge when I rescaled everything. On the other hand, I can imagine that I have a more complicated theory than quantum electrodynamics. And I have a, uh, not just electrons around, but also protons and pi mesons and all their strong interactions or something like that. Now, if I didn't have a rule like this, C equals minus D, <laughs> Then I would be in a, in a funny situation. I would find the electric charge renormalization for the proton would be different for the electric charge renormalization for the electron. Because it's the ratio C over D that determines the, what the bare charge is. Aside from factors that depend on A prime, and A prime is the same A prime for the electron and the proton. Now, that's very funny, because empirically, I know that the electron charge is equal in magnitude to the proton charge to billions of decimal points. Not really billions, but quite a few. <laughs> On the other hand, I know all the interactions of the proton are very different from the interactions of the electron. So if I didn't have the C equals minus D rule, I would be in a peculiar situation where I would have to say, the empirical, almost exact equality of the charges is a total coincidence. The bare charges are completely different by amounts that depend on the cutoff and the strong interaction coupling constant and God knows what else. And they have just been so cunningly adjusted by God when he created the universe so that the physical charges came out exactly equal. Who believes that? <laughs> it's a possibility. God is nice, but he's not that nice. <laughs> so let's, let's keep... Let's try and remember that this, this sort of a relationship is very useful if we're to explain the universality of electric charge. That is, that equality of physical charges for two different particles should imply equality of bare charges. As it happens, I will demonstrate equals zero. That is, there is no renormalization of the gauge parameter alpha. No need to introduce a counter term for the gauge parameter. Now, the um, the tools with which I prove this are uh, so are, which I'm going to prove this are so-called ward identities. Uh, I, before I let you go, I'm going to take five minutes, and it's really only going to be five minutes, to um, tell you what these things are. <coughs> these are the identities that will enable me to prove, order by order and renormalized perturbation theory, that if these equations on the center board are true to a given order, then they're true to the next order up, and thus show the consistency of the renormalization program with gauge and period. Let me focus on this equation, c equals minus d. If it is true, it implies that there is some connection between this kind of graph, which tells us the d-type counter term, and this kind of graph, 
which tells us the C-type counterterm. Now, I will show you that there is, in a remote way, some kind of connection between those things. Let me define a little j mu to be just psi bar gamma mu psi. Now, <clears throat> at equal times, j0 of x and t psi of y and t by an elementary application of the canonical commutation <coughs> rules is i delta cubed of x minus y psi of y and t. Actually, it's minus i. <laughs> well, then the plus sign for psi bar. Now, if I consider an object like the time order product a vacuum expectation value j mu of x psi of y psi bar of z and consider its divergence with respect to x. You recall our rule for finding the, diver the uh, time derivative of a time ordered product. We get an equal time commutator plus the differentiated term. In this case, the differentiated term is irrelevant because d mu j mu equals 0. And therefore, we only pick up the equal time commutators when the time here is the same as the time here, and the time here is the same as the time here. Therefore, I get minus i delta fourth x minus y vacuum psi of y psi bar of z the space delta function from the commutator I have written down and the time delta function from differentiating the theta function plus i delta 4 of x minus z vacuum, same thing. Now, this is not a derivation I will ever do again. I wanted to show it to you because it's a kind of derivation that is based in Bjorkin and Drell. We're going to do things in a quite different method. But you can begin to see an edge or an inkling of how we can somehow establish a connection in some sense between at least some part of this object and some part of this object. In some sense, little j mu is the thing the photon is going to couple in when it burrows into that diagram and hits its first Fermi line. The first thing it's got to do is hit a Fermi line, and then it's going to couple to little j mu. So this thing is, in some sense, connected to the right hand, left-hand side of this equation. On the other hand, on the right-hand side of the equation, we have known quantities times a fermion two-point function, which is this object over here. But it's written in a terribly messy form, and it's sort of awful. I've got an equation for, I haven't really got a Green's function because I've got to take off the photon line to get to that j mu. I've derived an equation for full Green's functions, and renormalization is expressed in terms of one particle irreducible Green's functions. And the whole thing, I would have to manipulate and manipulate and manipulate this thing to eventually prove what I want to prove, c equals minus d. And then I would have to write down a whole bunch of other messy equations and manipulate and manipulate and manipulate them to show the other things I want to prove, the other things on the center board. So I'm not going to do it this way. Okay? It's also a mess because I've written everything in terms of unrenormalized fields, and I've got to figure out how to write them in terms of renormalized fields. And it's yucky, oof, awful. Instead, I'm going to use a method based on functional methods to derive the identities that will enable us to essentially read off the, these equations and all the consequence of the things you get by this kind of manipulation without going through any combinatoric work. Unfortunately, as a preliminary for that, I have to further develop the functional method. In particular, I have to show you how to construct the generating functional for IPI diagrams in terms of the generating functional for a full Green's functions, something we don't yet know how to do. But 30 minutes into next lecture, you will know how to do it. And then we can go. Then we can work it out. There is a problem set 